Welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Janet Adkison. Well, we're about to turn the calendar into the third year of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we continue to bring you the latest information on the virus and its impact on rural America. Well, I'm joined this evening by Dr. Jeffrey Gold, Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And later, we will also be joined by Dr. Jill Poole, who serves as the Chief of the Allergy and Immunology Division at UNMC. And Dr. Gold, as always, thanks for taking the time to chat with us this evening. I know our viewers are looking forward to the updates that you bring for us and, of course, the opportunity also to ask their own questions of you. Now, we are in our second week of February, so with all things considered, Dr. Gold, how are we looking? Well, you know, I think, uh, Janet, as we started reporting last week, uh, the news is, is good. So let's get right into the graphics because I think they do tell the story and they send a very powerful message to our rural and to our urban communities. So if we could get the first chart, as we always do, we start off with the worldwide information. Uh, and as you can see uh, that we're still uh, well over 2 million cases per day, uh, well over 10,000 deaths per day. Uh, but the case count over the last 14 days worldwide is down by about 14%. And of course, the hospitalizations and the deaths are a lagging indicator. When we look at the global map, uh, we see that there's still quite a bit of activity uh, throughout Western Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, the Far East, the Middle East, of course, uh, significantly uh, in uh, North America, South America, uh, and Australia. Uh, and uh, as we'll see in just a few minutes, the overwhelming majority of this is still the Omicron strain that we've been talking about uh, for the last several weeks. You know, when we look uh, across our nation here, you can see that we're just under, uh, we just got below 300,000 cases uh, per day. Uh, that's a significant reduction in the 14 day running average of approximately 57%. Now, you know, the audience will remember it was not that long ago that we were at 600, 700, 800, 850,000 cases uh, per day. So that's a really big fall off. And as we look at the, some of the details now, uh, you can see that uh, historically over the last several weeks, almost the entire U.S. map was deeply purple in color, indicating very high transmission rates of uh, COVID. But now we're starting to see uh, lighter oranges, ambers, even some yellow uh, throughout the mid-Atlantic, the uh, Northeast. Uh, certainly, if you look at the central part of the country around some of the rural, urban and rural parts of Nebraska, but also look at parts of Idaho, uh, parts of northern Texas, we're starting to see a significant change in, in coloration, meaning that the transmission rates uh, are reducing. Now, the hospitalization rates and death rates, of course, are lagging indicators, and we'll look at that uh, in just a second. Uh, if we look at some of the highest rates in the country right now, the U.S. average, uh, 89 cases per 100,000 per day. Alaska is at 243, Mississippi at 166, uh, Tennessee at about 162. This is over the last 24 hours. So there are still parts of the country uh, that are significantly more uh, than twice the U.S. average in case transmission. But even those parts of the country, uh, for the most part, are, are seeing reductions. If you look at the case chart, uh, number of cases uh, per day and the seven day running average, what you can see is we peaked out uh, US wise, uh, you know, several weeks ago with a very steep decline, frankly, steeper than the beta decline, steeper than the delta decline that we had uh, during uh, August and September. Uh, and hopefully, uh, unless something changes with yet another variant or another pattern of transmission, uh, hopefully that decline uh, will continue and get us down to what people are estimating to be a new normal level by mid to late March across all of the urban and rural communities uh, of our nation. You know, I keep reminding the audience about this graphic and we're gonna be talking a little bit more about the BA2 subtype of the Omicron variant in a few minutes. But just to make the point, uh, the preliminary data that we're seeing in the United States, but also uh, from Western Europe, parts of uh, Denmark, uh, Sweden, and other Scandinavian countries, 
uh, is that it doesn't appear to be associated with a higher hospitalization or death rate, but it does appear to be about one and a half times uh, more infectious, a higher transmission rate. And so as we've gone from the original Wuhan variant of the virus into Delta, and from Delta now into Omicron, uh, we're seeing this trend of more transmission and fortunately lower case severity. But the volume is what has been packing our hospitals. Uh, this is a map of the BA2 uh, globally, the subtype that we've been concerned of. And of course, as we can see, uh, we have a significant amount of it uh, in almost all states in the United States now. Uh, certainly uh, in Denmark, where it was one of the first places it was identified, but now all through uh, India, uh, the southern horn of Africa, uh, and some of the far eastern uh, and subcontinent parts uh, of the world. And the prediction is that over time, this will uh, continue to change. If you look at this graphic, this is uh, coming to us from our Scandinavian colleagues. It looks out at the transmission rates of the BA2 subtype variant of Omicron. And what you can see on the panel marked probability of testing positive, uh, you can see that the, the blue line on the bottom is the BA1 subtype variant, and the red line just above it is the BA2. And it just sort of makes the point that the BA2 is indeed spreading faster uh, week over week uh, across the, uh, uh, in this case, uh, from Denmark, but uh, certainly true uh, in the United States and, uh, and elsewhere. So we will keep an eye on that. And this is uh, also, uh, you know, studies uh, from the same part of the world that don't just look at cases, but look at hospitalizations and deaths. And what you can see is that although the BA2 subtype uh, through the end of January uh, is uh, transmitting faster, it is causing hospitalization and it is causing death uh, on, as a delayed indicator, uh, as we would expect just from the pure volume of the number of individuals uh, who particularly are unvaxxed uh, that are getting infected in different parts of the world. Uh, this was a study that was uh, recently published that I thought it's a lot of numbers and complexity, but I draw your attention to the circles on the bottom that looked at transmission rates of the BA2 subtype variant for unvaccinated, fully vaccinated individuals that had naturally occurring immunity as a result of infection and individuals that were boosted and vaccinated. And what it shows us is that in each of those categories, uh, the BA2 subtype variants about 50% more. So about 50% more of those that are unvaxxed are getting infected about 50% more transmission for fully vaxxed, for, uh, for those that are previously infected, and for those that are fully vaxxed and boosted, uh, just reinforcing the data that we've been observing. Uh, when we start to look at U.S. hospitalizations, 37 hospitalizations uh, per 100,000, that is substantially down. Uh, you see we're at 121,000 there. We were several weeks ago at about 185,000, so that number is down. But again, as a lagging indicator, West Virginia, Alabama, Washington, D.C., Kentucky, Arkansas, parts of our country that saw a very high surge uh, in, uh, of Omicron variant several weeks ago are now seeing that lagging indicator in hospitalizations uh, per 100,000 on a, on a given day. But again, these numbers are falling uh, across the country. Go on now if we can. Uh, this is a look at uh, some of the subtypes that we're seeing. As you see in the uh, amber color, uh, those were Delta variant cases across the United States. So we're almost uh, just under 100% Omicron right now, which is a mixture, still predominantly BA1 subtype in this country, but uh, increasing in the BA2 uh, variant. Uh, this just geographically shows us that for a long time, we were seeing residual amounts of Delta uh, in, uh, in zone eight, zone seven, and zone six in the central part of the HSS healthcare zones of our nation. But now we're essentially 100% uh, Omicron uh, in this, indicated by this deep color uh, purple. Uh, if we look at our hospitalization rates across the US, 
Uh, you can see, as the numerical chart uh, earlier showed, uh, now we can see graphically that we did peak out at higher hospitalizations than as a seven-day running average than we've ever had before due to this pandemic. But we are coming down, and we're coming down faster than any of the previous peaks. And so, again, hopefully that trend will be sustained, and it certainly gives me a good feeling for uh, optimism. I wanted to draw our viewers' attention, Janet, uh, to this chart. And again, there are a lot of different numbers here, but we get asked frequently uh, from our audience about what's going on with children, meaning ages zero to 17. Uh, and so what this shows us is that uh, over 25 million uh, confirmed uh, infections, or of which over 22 million have been symptomatic, but 250, 265,000 hospitalizations of children 17 years of age and under. Now, fortunately, uh, very fortunately, only 645 confirmed deaths. But, you know, you think about it, 260,000 hospitalizations. I mean, that's nowhere near uh, the 3.2 million hospitalizations we've seen in the ages of uh, 65 and older. But a lot of these kids are pretty young, and our children's hospitals, due to Omicron, are pretty full, particularly in our part of the country. And I know that the East Coast and the West Coast have seen some very similar trends in pediatric hospitalization. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. If we shift our discussion to deaths, uh, you can see that the U.S. average uh, has been running uh, about 0.77 per 100,000. But Mississippi, South Carolina, Ohio, Tennessee, Guam are one and a half to uh, almost three times uh, the U.S. average of the number of deaths. And when we look at some of the trends, again, the death rates or the case fatality rates are a lagging indicator. You can see where those are happening, uh, largely across the United States, again, mirroring where the case rates were particularly high. And although the uh, case rate chart has shown a significant fall off, we're starting to see a fall off uh, in the hospitalization rate. You can see that the death rates still are hopefully at a peak, uh, but you know I, I wouldn't declare uh, victory around that just yet. And again, substantially higher uh, than we saw with the Delta variant just a few short months ago in terms of uh, per 100,000 running average. If we look at some of the smaller counties, uh, well, for instance, in uh, the Nome census area uh, in Alaska, uh, you know, uh, U.S. average 89 per 100,000, uh, 713 per 100,000 in the Nome census area. If we look at Adair, Oklahoma, uh, and other parts uh, of the state of Washington, again, uh, just to make the point that our smaller communities our farming and ranching communities particularly, are, some of them are still seeing extremely high transmission rates, which unfortunately have resulted in hospitalization rates and uh, fatality rates uh, associated with it. Uh, so I wanted to take a minute and just remind our audience here, uh, looking at the panel of cases and the panel of deaths, and that to this day, there is still a five-fold benefit uh, for those individuals that are vaccinated, uh, even if they've not been boosted, uh, to prevent them from getting infected. And there's still over a 20-fold benefit uh, of being vaccinated uh, in preventing death uh, from COVID. So, you know, if you want to play the odds, there's a 20 to 1 benefit uh, for those that are vaccinated. And, uh, and frankly, uh, uh, even higher than that, uh, you can see and the average uh, deaths per week per 100,000. The unvaxxed are still running uh, just under eight. The vaxxed, but without a booster, are running less than 10% of that. And those that are boosted are even lower. So I think to put this all into a summary, Janet, uh, there were roughly, and I wanted to get this exactly right uh, for our audience, uh, there were roughly 44 deaths per 100,000 unvaccinated adults age 60 and older. Vaccination dropped that number from 44 to 3.6 per 100,000 or 12 times less. And those that were boosted, they dropped that number to 0. 0.5, you know, uh, uh, per 100,000 or 90 times less uh, chance of dying uh, from a COVID infection. So in spite of all of the 
media coverage about the Omicron uh, variants and the subtypes uh, and the impact of vaccination and previous infection, there is still no question that our vaccines and particularly our boosters are markedly impacting the rate of serious illness, hospitalization and death. And so with that, I very much look forward to uh, answering the questions from our audience tonight. And of course, in just a few minutes, uh, introducing Dr. Jill Poole, uh, who has special expertise in the area of allergy and immunology. Well, Dr. Gold, as always, you bring us a whole lot of information, a lot of good detailed information, uh, pointing out, of course, that grim milestone of 900,000 deaths uh, in the United States from COVID. How fast are we really slowing down this number? Uh, just putting it into manner of phrase, I suppose. Yeah, so uh, as you point out, Janet, the 900,000 number is an incredibly grim statistic. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, as we've mentioned several times, it is probably somewhat underreported. There are some estimates that, that that number is over a million, and some think it's actually closer to 1.1 or 1.2 million. Uh, unfortunately, I do think that although we have seen the peak hospitalization rate, uh, that we have not seen the end of this uh, incredible loss of life for individuals that are currently hospitalized or are yet to be hospitalized due to Omicron. So I wouldn't be surprised uh, if we get closer to a million uh, confirmed deaths and possibly uh, even break that. Uh, you know, I think the availability of oral antiviral agents, and we've talked a lot about the Merck and the Pfizer drugs, as well as uh, uh, outpatient uh, remdesivir, and some of the other things we've learned have markedly reduced hospital mortality. Uh, and so we are blunting that death curve, particularly given the number of individuals. I mean, the best thing we can do is prevent infection and prevent hospitalization. But I do think we're doing a better job in keeping people off of ventilators and keeping people uh, from losing their lives uh, to this disease. Uh, you know, hopefully uh, in the next couple of weeks, we'll be through this. You know, Dr. Gold, uh, as we start to see numbers ease, it's just human nature, so to speak, to relax just a bit, uh, maybe ease of letting go of some of the restrictions or some of the practices that we picked up over the last couple of years. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, relaxing a little bit? Is it a little too soon? You know, I think it depends on the community uh, and what's going on in the state and in the city or in the rural community as to where they are in terms of hospitalization and death rates and case rates. But overall, I think it's a bit too early to relax completely. All right. Well, Dr. Gold, thank you. We're going to continue this conversation. And before we go to break, well, let's open our phone lines. That phone number to call is 877-731-6733. Call in with your questions. And when we come back, Dr. Jill Poole will join our conversation as well. And welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Janet Adkison. And joining us once again, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And we now also welcome Dr. Jill Poole. She's the Chief of the UNMC Department of Internal Medicine's Division of Allergy and Immunology. And as always, both of you, thank you for taking the time to chat with us. We've had the chance to talk with Dr. Gold here for a little bit, Dr. Poole. Uh, prior to the show getting started, Dr. Gold, I know that you had a question that you wanted to circle back to from a caller in previous shows. Uh, I'll let you go ahead and dive into that if you'd like to. Sure. Thank you, Janet. So last week we had a caller who was talking about the fact that he had uh, tested positive for COVID, uh, recovered from it, but still had a rash and that uh, he went to see his local healthcare professional and uh, the uh, answer was uh, not sure there's much to do about it. But that prompted me to think that Dr. Poole would be somebody we could ask uh, and get a little bit more information of how common are rashes associated uh, with COVID, uh, how long they might last, and I think importantly, uh, whether there's any advice we would give our patients if they came in with a rash after recovering from COVID. So Dr. Poole, any thoughts on that? 
Uh, yes, it's not uh, very common to have a rash with COVID, but it's not uh, uncommon. So I've certainly have, we've seen uh, COVID induced rashes. Usually they're gone within a few weeks. Um, it'd be unusual that they would last several months, uh, but they, it can, if it's uh, itching or bothersome, then there are anti-itch medications that can be taken and even creams that can be applied. But if it lasts several weeks, um, that's time to go get it checked out by your uh, physician. Well, thank you both for tackling that question. It's always good to circle back whenever somebody didn't get their uh, response earlier. Now, we do have the phone lines open, the number to call 877-731-6733. And we have our first caller of the night on the line with us. We have Jim from Oregon. Jim, why don't you go ahead with your question or comment? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, this is the second time I've seen the show one last, uh, last week. Pretty much talked about the the um, oh I forget the name of the drugs, but uh, I've had the Johnson and Johnson. I've had the Johnson and Johnson first shot plus the booster, and I've had recovered from a case of uh, uh, COVID. So I assume I'm pretty much bulletproof now. But you didn't mention the or it seemed like you jumped over the Johnson and Johnson and weren't talking specifically about those, and we were talking about the other two, the Moderna and the and the other one. Dr. Gold? Sure. Well, uh, Jim, thank you for, uh, for calling in. Uh, I appreciate it. So we've, we, you're absolutely right. We have spent a good deal of time talking about the two mRNA vaccines, the Moderna and the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Uh, the J&J &J vaccine has behaved somewhat differently. It is a different type of vaccine. It's what we call a virus vector vaccine. And the indications for getting boosted are... Uh, are somewhat different. Uh, for those that received the, uh, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, uh, we're currently recommending five months, and there was actually some discussion recently about moving that to three months. The J&J &J product is somewhat different, and the recommendation was to boost that, uh, if possible, uh, in two months. And that's because of the reinfection rate and also the measured antibody rate. And I think uh, perhaps what you're referring to, Jim, is that when we looked at the antibody production, we, the scientific community that would be, following a booster in what was called the mix and match trial, which was when we looked at what happened if you got J&J &J and then boosted it with either Moderna or Pfizer, what happened if you got Pfizer and boosted it with either J&J &J or Moderna. Uh, it turns out that if you mix and match, particularly if you got the J&J, &J, and you boosted it with either the Pfizer or the Moderna, you got a higher antibody level. Uh, and that probably is associated uh, with being more resistant to infection and to serious uh, illness. However, uh, I wouldn't quite characterize you as being bulletproof uh, just yet, but certainly I think between uh, recovering from your infection, uh, getting a full dose of vaccine and getting a booster, I think you've done everything you can, obviously, uh, you want to still, uh, uh, you know, adhere to some precautions, particularly if you have any of the medical conditions, you know, that would put you at higher risk. And we've talked a lot about those in the past that weaken your immune system. So I hope that answers your question. Well, Jim, we certainly appreciate you calling again. That was Jim from Oregon with that question. The phone lines are open, 877-731-6733. And Dr. Poole, before we also get too heavy into things, uh, many of us also suffer from allergies uh, during cold season, during just summertime. What's the most common thing that you hear and what's maybe the best, most common sense solution that you suggest for allergy sufferers? Is there a one size fits all for most or is everyone a bit different? Well, there's a lot of options for, uh, for treatment for people with their allergies. Um, and there's a lot of over-the-counter medications that are available. Um, I really recommend if it, they're nasal symptoms, you go with the sinus rinse um, or nasal irrigations and try the non-sedating, the non-drowsy antihistamines, as well as using the uh, steroid nasal sprays uh, for a short term to see if that's also beneficial to you. Um, but you know, this time of year, we're seeing a lot of indoor allergy problems. Um, and so making sure you know, things are clean or if there's uh, filters and such you need for your pets or um, carpeting and upholstered uh, furniture. 
You know, that's a good reminder. I need to change the filters in the house myself, so put that on the to-do list. Now, again, the phone lines are open. We have Audrey from Minnesota on the line with us here this evening. Audrey, why don't you go ahead with your question or comment? Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Gold. I think we've all received so much good information from you. My question, because of my immunity deficit status, I have been the first around here to be notified of the need for my second booster shot. And I am reluctant because of my body's reaction with, to the first booster shot, which included the rash you mentioned and also the joint locking. Anyway, my question. Now, for my second booster, what should I do? Should I choose the Moderna for my second booster since I have had three shots of Pfizer vaccine already? Dr. Gold? Well, thank you very much for uh, calling us, Audrey, and that is an interesting question and an important one. So as I understand it, what you said is that you've been fully vaxxed and you've had one booster and that you've had uh, somewhat uh, immunocompromised uh, situation with your own medical health issues, but that you had a rash and some joint discomfort uh, associated with the first booster that you received. You know, I think Dr. Poole would be particularly knowledgeable and experienced to, you know, answer that question. But before I turn it over to her, I'd say this should always be the judgment of your healthcare professional. You'd order the, pers the persons uh, or the individual that's treating you for your medical problems is always the place to start off with uh, getting good medical information because everybody is slightly different. But overall, Dr. Poole, I know that for people that are immunocompromised, there's been quite a bit of discussion about getting a fourth shot of one of the uh, mRNA vaccines. Uh, what do you think uh, we might recommend uh, under those circumstances? Um, yes, if it's been more than even six months since your uh, booster shot um, and you're immunocompromised, I think having the conversation and getting the, the fourth shot is something that may be beneficial. Um, from an allergy perspective, having some aches and pains and having a rash is not uncommon from a booster and probably with the fourth as well. And so taking some Tylenol or even an antihistamine can kind of get you over the hump of those couple of days of having some adverse reactions to the, the vaccine that are usually really mild and self-limiting for a couple of days. But it, it really may be beneficial in immunocompromised individuals to go ahead and get um, a, a fourth shot, but it's not, um, it's up to you and, and your physician. Again, that was Audrey from Minnesota. Thank you for your call here, Audrey. And we also have Bob from New York on the line. Again, we are taking calls, 877-731-6733. Bob from New York, why don't you go ahead with your question or comment? Bob? Yeah? Go ahead with you your question or comment. Now? Yes. All right, my question is to Dr. Gold. I had my booster shot. Uh, December 6th, and now I had very little reaction in my shoulder. It hurt, and that's the only thing I had. But now, two months later, that same spot is hurting more than it did the first time. Dr. Gold? Hmm. You know, that's uh, pretty unusual. Uh, I wonder whether there might be something else going on. You know, I would wonder whether it's red or tender or swollen or anything of that nature. Uh, do we have we seen delayed uh, local reactions, uh, Dr. Poole? And if so, is there any advice uh, that we might uh, recommend for Bob other than to contact his local healthcare professional and, uh, and uh, have somebody take a look? Well, I would agree with you, Dr. Gold. Two months, um, that's pretty that's a very long time to be having a delayed reaction occur. And so I would have uh, something checked out to see if there's not something else going on uh, there or if there's any redness and get it examined. But that would be unusual. 
Now, Dr. Poole, as someone who studies how other diseases affect the lungs, how is COVID-19 similar and maybe how is it different? Do allergic asthma or COPD or even end-stage lung disease, does that give us a bit of insight into COVID? Well, COVID acts uh, differently than um, a lot of the other viral infections, obviously. Um, and so when we've been seeing how it affects the lungs, uh, it, especially in the unvaccinated, we're seeing a lot of uh, immune response, uh, an overwhelming immune response with a lot of fevers and then a lot of inflammation that can be on the lungs and that can be delayed. And so there's been people who have been infected will have um, even delayed recovery from it. Obviously, um, the people that are real severe will end up you know, being hospitalized and sometimes, unfortunately, in the intensive care units. Uh, but the patients with more mild disease can have this dry cough and lung inflammation that can go on for weeks and months after they've had COVID. And it's a different type of cough and it's a different type of shortness of breath than those that have um, usual asthma. Uh, the patients with COPD are the ones that are more at risk of having adverse outcomes, but those with severe asthma are also at risk of having adverse outcomes from having the COVID infection. Well, Dr. Poole, thank you very much for answering that. And I forgot to thank Bob from New York for his call. We certainly appreciate him taking the time to chat. And also, we have Julia from Georgia on the line with us this evening. And Julia, if you're available, go ahead with your question or comment. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? We got you. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, I've been losing my hair for since I had the covid um, the last two months, it's still, I had the COVID in August, and I was in the ICU for a month in a coma. They had to intubate, so I'm still losing my hair, and I was wondering when am I going to get that back. And I have had the first two, the two injections of the Pfizer. Well, thank you for calling, Julia. I might point out I lost my hair a long time ago and didn't have to uh, lose it to uh, COVID. But uh, uh, I would, uh, I think this is also uh, something very specific uh, that you might want to talk to your local doctor about. But let's uh, uh, see what Dr. Poole thinks about the loss of hair, uh, particularly if we've seen it uh, in the setting of, uh, of this severe uh, type of COVID infection. Um, we definitely have seen hair loss from severe illnesses in general, and then COVID would be in that category. So when your body undergoes such stress uh, from such a severe infection, it's not unusual that you can, uh, particularly women will see that, um, a delayed response. It may not occur for several months after your severe infection and, and it can last for a while. It'll ultimately recover. It may be a year or two before your hair growth comes back, but this is a consequence of your severe illness and, and how your body responded to it. Uh, but I would recommend good nutrition, um, and make sure your, your vitamins and check with your doctor to make sure there's nothing else prolonged getting routine laboratory work. Julia, thank you very much for your question there from Georgia. Now we turn to the show me state. We have Jay from Missouri on the line with us. Jay, why don't you go ahead with your question or comment? Yes, uh, my question is because this is spread aerosolarly, if that's a word, how long does it last on other surfaces, kitchen counters, remotes, telephones, or that kind of a situation? Dr. Gold? Sure. So uh, there's been a lot of research uh, that looked at surface spread, particularly early on uh, with the original uh, variant that we saw, you know, two years ago. And then we continue to monitor that. So you are absolutely right, Jay, that the primary mode of spread of COVID now, particularly with the Omicron variant, is by aerosol. But the studies have shown that you can recover some virus uh, from surfaces such as bathroom counters, doorknobs, uh, air filters, et cetera, uh, for several days uh, after the virus has been uh, lodged on those surfaces. But the number of virus particles goes down very, very rapidly. 
So how much you can actually get infected, uh, you know, is, is really unknown right now. Uh, some would say uh, that it's a matter of hours. You know, if you think about it, uh, it it's, it's got to be a function of how much virus is actually put on the surface. So if there's a lot of virus on the surface or if there's a lot of virus in the air, it's probably going to linger longer in terms of hours to days on the surfaces. If there's just a small amount, it'll probably dissipate uh, quickly. So we are still, you know, doing surface cleansing uh, and recommending it. Uh, but we're also very strongly recommending the use of uh, good fitting uh, masks, either procedural masks, KN95s or N95s. Uh, in order to reduce uh, the transmission from the uh, aerosols. You know, as we said earlier, uh, you know, reasonable amounts of distancing and uh, good hand sanitizing are all really important uh, parts of making sure that we're not spreading COVID to uh, well, Jay, thank you very much for your call here this evening. Again, our phone lines are open, 877-731-6733. And before we take a break, Dr. Poole, one more question. And you and Dr. Gold have talked about this just a bit here this evening. Uh, I understand that you're currently conducting a COVID split dose versus full vaccine study. Would you explain that research a little bit more and any early results that you might be able to share? Thanks, Janet. We, um, as allergists, we get a lot of questions and concerns about adverse and allergic reactions to the vaccines. And so back in uh, January of last year, when we were doing our employee health vaccines um, with thousands of people, um, a small percent of them were having adverse or concerns about adverse reactions or allergic reactions. And so they came to our clinic to be assessed. And um, what allergists can do is we do something called a split dose where we give a little bit of dose of the vaccine followed by a bigger dose and we monitor them in our clinics um, up to a couple hours and we did that with a number of the employees and found that they tolerated the vaccine really quite well and so now what we're doing is we're uh, enrolling patients to get either the split dose or the full dose and we're measuring their pre and their post uh, antibody response to the vaccines um, to make sure that we, we know it's safe so far. The split dosing has been really safe and tolerated that we can give a test dose before we give the full dose. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we're getting great antibody response. And at this point, Janet, we don't have preliminary data on the antibody response, but our experience has been that the split dosing uh, is extremely well tolerated. And so patients that were very fearful of getting the vaccine for their fear of the allergic reactions that maybe they've had in the past to other, other medicines or other things that were uh, preventing them from getting the vaccine, they've been able to safely get the vaccine with us. All right. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Well, again, we are going to take a quick break, but we have more rural health matters, including more of your calls coming up here in just a moment. Stay with us. And welcome back to Rural Health Matters. Joining us once again, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and Dr. Jill Poole, also with the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Now, as we continue on this evening, our phone lines are open. We're taking your calls, 877-731-6733. And we have Gary on the line with us here to get this block started. He is from Oregon. Gary, why don't you go ahead with your question or comment? Thank you very much, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Gold and everyone that participates in this show. Dr. Gold, I've heard you the most. I appreciate you very much and trust your information and appreciate what you do. My question, Omicron uh, vaccine, is that likely going to be just one dose? My second uh, question is, if one gets the, the infection and tests positive, and then say seven to 10 days uh, tests negative, uh, if that person sheds virulent virus, uh, why would we call it a negative test? Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Dr. Gold? Oh, two. Yeah, two very good questions, Gary, and thanks for your kind words. Appreciate it very much. Uh, just take uh, the, the first question uh, really uh, is about the Omicron specific uh, vaccines that are being developed by both Moderna and Pfizer, as you may have heard, uh, they have begun clinical trials 
Uh, these are booster doses, Gary. These are not meant to be the primary series. Now, whether they will be converted into a primary series uh, for those that are not vaccinated remains to be seen. But the clinical trial that's currently going on for the Omicron uh, variant from both Pfizer and Moderna are in individuals that have been fully vaccinated. Half of them have had a booster, so this would be a second specific booster for them. And the other half have been fully vaxxed with either Pfizer or Moderna, but have not had any booster. And so uh, I, I hope that answers uh, that part of your question. And it turns out about the second question, which is also a really important question, is uh, when people can go back to work, back to school, socialize, et cetera, after they've tested positive for uh, uh, COVID. And there's, while there's no magic answer to this, because based on our very early research uh, during uh, the time we were caring for patients uh, off the Diamond Princess cruise line, we've identified that individuals can carry uh, virus, particularly fragments of virus, uh, for long periods of time, up to four, six, sometimes even seven or eight weeks, we've identified uh, small amounts of virus. But the, the question really is not whether there are bits and pieces of virus, but is whether or not that virus is viable, meaning it's alive. And secondly, whether there's enough of it to actually transmit to another individual uh, if they call for sneeze, uh, or have dinner or a drink or something uh, with somebody else. And that's why, you know, even after people test negative, we are still recommending that they use a good quality mask for at least five to seven days. And, and frankly, you know, uh, I, I can only tell you what our personal practices are and what I would do if I were in that situation. I would avoid being with people that were of older age, people that were immunocompromised, uh, who I would say are at higher risk, because the it's still quite variable, even after you've recovered from you know all of the fever and chills and body aches uh, that are associated uh, with the COVID infection. It's still quite possible that you could have just enough virus uh, to get somebody else infected. You know, I'll ask Dr. Poole what she thinks and what recommendations uh, uh, we're giving to our patients today. Well, Dr. Gold, uh, you su summarized it really um, excellent. Uh, after you've had an infection, you want to be really careful about who you're around and make sure you're really fully recovered. And uh, you know, still wear a, a mask really around the vulnerable populations as you don't want to get them sick. Well, Gary from Oregon, we appreciate your call here this evening. We appreciate you also tuning in as well. Uh, Dr. Poole, uh, as we said, uh, you're an allergy specialist. So if someone has a mild case of COVID-19, is there a chance that they might just confuse it and, and think it's just allergies? What are the signs that they need to look for specifically in each case? Well, uh, Janet, that's a great question because uh, with Omicron, some of the symptoms can be just like allergies from the sore throat, the post-nasal drip, even sinus infections. Uh, we've had a number of patients who think they're just having their, they call it their annual sinus infection, but we, we test everybody who calls us. And um, some of those, but not all, um, are, are positive for COVID. So it can be uh, nasal and sinus symptoms, just like your, your usual uh, cold or allergy symptoms. Uh, this time of year, seasonal allergies aren't a big uh, problem, except for in the South, um, we're starting to see some allergies. But right now, if you're getting those symptoms, I would be probably primarily concerned about um, an infection, a viral infection. I mean, besides COVID, there are, there's influenza and other infections, uh, but you'd probably want to get checked out to make sure it's not COVID. Um, now, allergy symptoms themselves tend to have more itching and sneezing than uh, the sore throat and the pain and pressure of, uh, of COVID. Now, and Dr. certainly we don't see fevers. Dr. Poole, on that note, if we happen to have pre-existing allergies, are we more susceptible to maybe a more serious case of COVID-19? Um, you know, not necessarily. Um, those with severe asthma and COPD are certainly at more risk of having severe COVID. But having 
Having allergies and actually taking your allergy medicines is going to be actually beneficial for these viral infections. And so if you know you have allergies, make sure you're taking your antihistamines and your nose sprays and your irrigations because those remedies are also helpful for limiting uh, the viral infections um, as well. All right. Well, with that, let's go back to the phone lines again. And we have Pam from Ohio on the line with us. Pam, why don't you go ahead with your question? Um, hello. Um, thank you, Dr. Gold, for um, having your show over the last two years and answering questions, especially for the ag community. And I was just wondering in the future if you will continue to talk on this show about health issues related to the ag community. Um, for example, like mental health issues, maybe issues related to the environment they work in, and issues maybe with working around animals. And I mean, I think there's a lot of health issues that could be specifically related to people in the rural community. Thank you. Well, thank you, Pam, for that wonderful question. And you know, as you may or may not realize, we actually started doing this show uh, specifically to talk about medical and behavioral health issues uh, in farming and ranching rural communities long before anybody ever heard of COVID. And it is our plan to continue it uh, and to talk specifically about the areas uh, that you mentioned. Uh, it is certainly our hope that we will not be so COVID focused, uh, you know, maybe even by the end of March or the beginning of April when we can start to once more uh, look at rural communities through a somewhat different lens. You know, as you may recall from some of the earlier shows, we've used multiple different uh, lenses to look at COVID. We've looked at it through the medical and through the behavioral health aspects of it. We've looked at it through the eyes of Farm Bureau, through some of our elected government officials. We've had the opportunity uh, to look at it through uh, you know, through the eyes of the Federal Reserve and what the economic aspects of this are and so many other different aspects that are unique to rural America. So thanks for your comments and, uh, and thanks for, uh, of course, for watching. Thank you, Pam, for your call there this evening. And pivoting off of Pam's thoughts there, uh, Dr. Poole, a lot of your work puts you in contact with rural and agricultural environments themselves and, of course, the people who live and work there. What took you to that area of study? Uh, yes, I, well, I'm from um, a smaller community in Nebraska called Grand Island, um, and so I grew up um, around um, a lot of farmers and uh, detasseled and was involved in that activity when I was younger. And then I trained in different areas, and when I came back to Nebraska, the issue that I found most interesting is the agricultural exposures and how that affects respiratory disease and how that affects allergies. And so I'm going on almost 17 plus years now of research in this area. And so we, we collect the uh, dust from uh, different farming communities like uh, swine confinement facilities, dairy barns, feedlot dust, or grain elevators. And we, we study how this dust affects uh, the lung. And so we have many publications looking at how the immune system responds to these agricultural exposures, particularly the large animal farming environments, and how that changes whether or not you have an allergic or a non-allergic, both inflammatory diseases. Uh, interesting enough, it tends to be more non-allergic inflammation, which is actually difficult because uh, the therapies that we currently have available are all for allergic inflammation, and we lack a lot of therapies for the non-allergic inflammation that agricultural workers have, and I currently was awarded a grant that I'm looking at new therapies that we can give post-exposure to see if we can reverse the inflammatory disease in the, in the lungs of people exposed to some of the overwhelming agricultural exposure environments or even other occupational environments too. Well, I look forward to hearing your results from that grant. Uh, now let's go back to the phone lines. We have Bill from North Carolina on the line with us. Bill, why don't you go ahead with your question or comment? Again, Dr. Gold, good evening. And Dr. Poole, thank you, Dr. Gold, for having her on. Um, I've had a hypersensitive uh, skin eruption in December, and after three, uh, four punch biopsies, it is now determined that I have a very rare um, PRP 
skin rash. Um, it is also determined that apparently I might be uh, the it might be the result of the polyethylene glycol vehicle that the Pfizer COVID uh, injection um, provided. Uh, if you have any thoughts, I'd love to hear what your input is. Thank you so much. And again, appreciate all you. Well, again, thank you for calling, Bill, and thanks for your kind words. Uh, I think Dr. Poole, uh, you know, any experience uh, with the uh, use of uh, the uh, allergic reactions to what we call the excipients, which are the materials that are mixed with vaccines and medications so that they can be safely delivered. Um, well, yes, it's again, it's very unusual to have a, a prolonged allergic reaction to these COVID vaccines because they've been really quite safe. Uh, across thousands and thousands of people, uh, millions now. Uh, but there have been reactions to the vaccine with these rashes uh, that we've had to tr use some uh, specialized treatment uh, for. Uh, your physician may prescribe these medications to treat if you're having one of these rare reactions uh, that need special medications to make it go away. But it is, it is really quite rare, but it is unfortunate that it happened to you. You know, I might just add, uh, if you don't mind, that uh, the use of polyethylene glycol is not uncommon uh, with multiple different medications. And so I think it would be worth, Bill, having a conversation uh, with your physician just to confirm that it's the PEG, the polyethylene glycol, that's the cause of your uh, condition. Because if that's the case, you're going to want to be careful with other medications in the future. Well, Bill, thank you very much and for you your call. And you could be tested. Go right ahead, Dr. Poole. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say to follow up, um, there are allergists out there that can test you to these different um, incipients in the COVID vaccine uh, to see if it's, if it's that or what we're seeing more that it's uh, a, a big inflammatory response to the vaccine itself, particularly in people who have already previously had COVID. They tend to have a more robust reaction to the vaccine. And Bill, thank you very much for your call. Again, that was Bill from North Carolina. Now we are winding down with just less than two minutes left. Uh, Dr. Poole, any last thoughts that you'd like to share? <laughs> I'd, I'd like to share that um, when, when in doubt about an allergic reaction, uh, please see your physician or an allergy specialist that can help work through it um, because you know being vaccinated is, is super important to preventing what we're seeing are a lot of prolonged complications to having the COVID infection. Thank you, Dr. Pola. And Dr. Gold, as always, I'd like to give you the final uh, moment to offer your final thoughts here this evening. Sure, I'd just like to thank Dr. Poole and, uh, and thank you, Janet, for the opportunity to join everybody tonight and just reinforce the fact that these vaccines are safe and they are effective. And, uh, you know, as the numbers continue to fall, uh, they will be con in increasingly important, particularly in our farming and ranching small communities. And I look forward to seeing everybody next week. And Dr. Gold, I do also want to point out that you've had the chance to, to get out of Nebraska. Uh, as you were traveling, did you see a lot of folks uh, following along in those guidelines that are still in place? You know, I did. I, uh, as you can tell from the screen, I'm currently in Scottsdale at some meetings. But as I traveled from airport to airport on multiple planes, et cetera, uh, I would say it was the I didn't see anybody that was not following the federal guidelines. Uh, so it made me feel really good and frankly, really safe. All right. Well, thank you both for joining us this evening. Again, UNMC Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold and Dr. Jill Poole, also with University of Nebraska Medical Center. Now, of course, if we didn't get to your question tonight, you can still leave us a voice recording on our hotline. That number is 855-776-6147. And remember, you can catch Rural Health Matters every Monday evening at 6 Eastern, 5 Central. Thanks for joining us.